Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to this breakout session on decision making capacity and the criminal justice system. Uh, my name is Martina Colville and I'm head of corporate in the Department of Justice and what was also equality. Our equality colleagues have moved to the Department of Children, Disability, Equality and Integration since the 14th of October. Uh, prior to the transfer of responsibilities, I was chair of the steering group on the implementation of the Decision Making Capacity Act with colleagues from Health, the HSE, the Court Service, the Mental Health Commission, uh, the Decision Support Service and my own department. Our aim as a group was to ensure that on commencement of the Act, the, the supports envisaged by the legislation would also be in place and accessible to the public. Our support for the work of the Decision Support Service was an important part of this objective with a view, a view to supporting uh, a mid-2022 commencement. Um, and I know that work will continue at pace in the new department uh, and with the, the guidance of uh, Anya and her team in uh, the Decision Support Service. I myself have worked uh, within the justice system since 2006. And I would acknowledge that despite being lucky enough to have capacity, it can be somewhat difficult to navigate. For those who intersect with the criminal justice system and who lack capacity, it must be a real challenge. I am delighted to be joined today by our speakers, uh, Anya Flynn, uh, Director of the Decision Support Service, uh, Louise Lachlan, National Manager with the National Advocacy Service for People with Disabilities, and Patricia Rickard Clark, Chair of Safeguarding Ireland and Chair of Sage Advocacy. I, I am very confident that um, the, um, our speakers today will provide significant insights and knowledge to inform the criminal justice system around capacity. Uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Anya uh, Flynn, Director of the Decision Support Service who is going to talk to you about the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act 2015 and the criminal justice context. And just before I hand to Anya, uh, I would just like to say that for anybody who would like to put questions to us, uh, that we will be taking questions, uh, you can use the Q&A uh, button on your right-hand side of your computer, and we will collect those Q&As and use them uh, to, to uh, question our, our speakers at the end of this session. Over to you, Anya. Thanks. Thanks very much, Martina, um, and thank you to the NDA for having me and for organising today's event. And it's certainly a pleasure to be joined by such esteemed panellists for this session. Um, so just in relation to my slides there, Dylan, if I could ask you to move to the the third one actually will do. Yeah. Um, so the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act of 2015 is what we're looking at. And um, that's what I'm talking about when I refer to the Act or to um, the, thank you. That, sorry, if you just want to take me back to slide three there, do you have it? Per yeah. And the one after that, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, what I thought I might do just for the benefit of those who are perhaps less familiar with the Act is to give a, a brief overview of the reforms which it introduces um, and then I'll say how I see those interfacing with the criminal law and with the, uh, the criminal justice system um, and what this might mean for persons with disabilities having regard in particular to our obligations under Article 13 of UNCRPD. Uh, it's an act that was signed into law right at the end of 2015. It isn't yet fully commenced, so a lot, though not all of what I refer to, is still in the future tense, but we hope at this stage imminent. The Department of Justice and Equality, um, who until recently had responsibility for the act, estimated uh, before the act was uh, fully signed into law that something like 200,000 people, adults, uh, living in Ireland could potentially be affected by the Act and benefit from its supports. And they were thinking there of people with intellectual disability, acquired brain injury, uh, forms of mental illness affecting decision-making capacity and age-related cognitive impairment, which isn't to say that those 200,000 people or any one of them would necessarily um, need the supports under the Act, and that will depend 
very much on individual circumstances. Uh, and those categories of people that I suppose they were thinking about, as we know, come within the definition of persons with disabilities uh, as defined by the convention. I'll have the next slide, please. OK, so thinking about um, key reforms then under the Act. Um, it abolishes the wards of court system, uh, which we still have administered under the uh, 1871 legislation. There won't be any new wards. All current wards will exit uh, wardship within three years. It puts in a statutory footing a functional test of capacity. It um, introduces important new guiding principles, a three-tier framework for support, and new tools for advanced planning, as well as establishing uh, the decision support service. The next slide, please, Dylan, thank you. The functional assessment of capacity. So there's no diagnostic criteria under the Act, um, and the 2015 Act is different from the Mental Capacity Act in England and Wales in that regard. So there's no sort of medical threshold, no defect of the mind or brain, as it's phrased in the UK legislation. With limited exceptions, the Act is not prescriptive or exhaustive about who may assess capacity. So there's a real move away from that medical model. And instead, the Act sets out that a person lacks capacity if unable to understand, retain, weigh up information and communicate a decision with appropriate assistance if necessary. So it's important to um, emphasise that all efforts must be made to help a person communicate, whether that's simply by way of plain English, uh, sign language, assistive technology or whatever that might be. And I'll take the next slide, please. So the guiding principles. Uh, the first guiding principle that we see in the Act in Section 8 is this presumption of capacity. Uh, so whatever somebody's presentation might be, they are presumed to have their full decision making capacity until the contrary is shown. Uh, that's a standard that already exists at common law, as does the functional test, I should say. Uh, they're already meant to be uh, the standard. The guiding principles also state that we must always support a person to make their own decisions as far as possible. So you don't move to assess capacity uh, until you've done everything to help a person exercise their own decision making autonomy. The right to be unwise, um, that's a, a bit of a paraphrase. Uh, what the Act actually says that uh, deciding to do something which seems unwise doesn't mean that you lack the capacity to decide to do it. And the Act also sets out the importance of dignity, respect for bodily integrity, privacy and autonomy, and importantly, the primacy of giving effect to will and preferences, uh, which is really regarded as, I suppose, the, the gold standard or the, the benchmark under UNCRPD. And also there's a duty on us to act in good faith and for the benefit of the person. I'll have the next slide, please. Thanks very much. Slide seven. Yeah, the, the Act breaks down categories of decision uh, into two uh, broad divisions. So we have property and affairs and personal welfare. I won't go through all of these. Um, these are the, the sorts of decisions with which a person might obtain support under the Act. And if we look at property affairs and the last one there, it includes the conduct of proceedings before any court or tribunal. So that somebody who benefits from decision supports under the Act could use those supports in the context of court or um, tribunal type proceedings. And you see that under personal welfare, the very broad catch-all category of decision at the bottom, um, the other matters relating to the person's well-being, which, which could cover um, a multitude, including, I would say, interaction uh, with the court system and with the criminal justice system. Um, slide eight then, the next one, please. So this is the piece of real innovation uh, under the Act, the three-tier framework which the Act introduces. Um, and then working upwards, you have at the bottom the decision-making assistant um, who helps with obtaining and explaining information, the co-decision maker with whom a person might take decisions jointly. And then at the upper tier, there is still provision for court-appointed decision-making representation very much as a last resort. And that person, that decision-making representative, makes decisions for the person, but only as provided for in the court order. And all of these decision supporters, as we tend to call them, uh, must abide by those guiding principles that I've mentioned. And the next slide, please. Yeah, advanced planning. Um, and in this respect, the Act really is um, an act for all of us. 
uh, because any one of us could have difficulties with our decision making capacity at a future point and the act provides opportunities to plan ahead for that by way of expanded enduring powers of attorney and statutory advanced health care directives which relate to medical treatment and allow a person while they have capacity to plan ahead and to provide legally binding advance refusal of treatment and I'll say a little bit more in a moment about advanced health care directives and what they might they might mean in the criminal law context. So turning then on the next slide if I may to the interface uh, between the act and criminal law and criminal justice. The first thing to say I suppose is that the act does create a number of new criminal offences uh, and these include the use of fraud, coercion or undue influence to force a person to enter into one of these decision support arrangements. And interestingly, the Act calls out that that can include leading a person to believe that entering into that arrangement is necessary in order to secure residential care. There's an offence of submitting false information in connection with any of these arrangements. Uh, that would be when you're interacting with either the court or with the decision support service and putting in um, false statements or misleading information. Or there's um, another offence of ill treatment or willful neglect by a decision supporter. Uh, and these carry penalties up to €500,000 fine or five years imprisonment on indictment. So foreseeably, uh, somebody with a disability who's in one of these decision support arrangements could be a complainant in respect of any of these new offences. It's also important to say, I think, that in the context of any of these decision support arrangements, um, a person could have a complaint of a, an offence which is already established um, at common law and statute, such as an offence under the Theft and Fraud Offences Act or an offence under the Non-Fatal Offences Act, an offence of assault. So it's important to be aware of that. And I'll just ask the next slide, please. So looking back then, um, advanced health care directives. Uh, treatment, medical treatment is predicated on consent uh, and the Act spells that out, it restates it if it needs to be stated that any person with uh, capacity is entitled to refuse medical treatment even if that seems ill-advised, uh, not based on sound medical evidence and even if it could uh, result in death. Uh, and it's possible by way of an advanced health care directive to set out that refusal of treatment in advance. Looking at AHDs then, uh, advanced healthcare directives and what they mean for the criminal law and criminal liability, part eight of the act sets out that this doesn't affect any change in the existing law on murder, manslaughter or assisted suicide, so it's important to say that, um, and that no civil or criminal liability arrives, arises for a healthcare professional who complies with an advanced healthcare directive, believing it to be valid and applicable, or does not comply with the refusal of treatment, reasonably believing that that advanced healthcare directive is not valid or is not applicable, or if that advanced, if that healthcare professional simply doesn't know about the advanced healthcare directive or can't obtain it and treatment is urgent and, and cannot be delayed until the AHG can be found. So those are circumstances where the healthcare professional doesn't need to worry about criminal liability arising. However, the Act also states that uh, the existing law is otherwise unaffected. So again, foreseeably, somebody with a disability who has an advanced health care directive in place could potentially um, have a criminal complaint and be a complainant in respect of um, such a matter if the AHG were not to be respected. And the next slide, please. The Act also provides for an exception so that if a person is being treated, if their treatment is regulated under Part 4 of the Mental Health Act, or if they've been conditionally discharged under the Criminal Law Insanity Act, then an advanced health care directive is not binding if it relates to the refusal of treatment for a mental disorder. In other words, you can, when you have capacity, make an advanced health care directive and expect it to be respected. But if you come to be detained and your treatment regulated under Part 4 of the Mental Health Act, then it doesn't bind the hands of the treating healthcare professionals if you're refusing treatment for a mental disorder. Now, there was a private member's bill which had gone some distance uh, during the last uh, Doyle, which would have amended that exception, but interestingly leaves it in place, um, retains that exception in respect of Criminal Law Insanity Act cases. So we're thinking there about people who have been found unfit to plead, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, or who have been transferred out of the prison system 
um, and are receiving treatment in a designated center, uh, which is only the, the central mental hospital. So it would retain that exception for, for people in that category have made an AHD in which they refuse mental health treatments. Um, the Act has nothing else to say about criminal responsibility or the Criminal Law and Sanity Act. Um, and you'll find very interesting discussions elsewhere about that intersection between criminal responsibility and the concept of um, legal capacity under Article 12 UNCRPD, uh, for those of you who are interested. I'll take the next slide, please. Okay, the Act does set out specific certain exclusions in respect of criminal justice. Um, and what we're thinking about here are instances stated in the Act where uh, the Act leaves intact existing provisions around capacity and where it says that the supports supplied under the Act don't get to step in to supply consent. So um, there are, I think, two of these which specifically deal with the criminal justice context. The Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act definition remains uh, concerning a consent to sexual relations. And it sets out that um, a person is found not to have capacity if due to a mental illness, disability or intellectual disability, they're incapable of understanding, evaluating and communicating consent. So we can see there that it's quite close to how capacity is defined and assessed by the 2015 Act. But it does include that diagnostic threshold. It sets out that this derives from mental illness, disability or intellectual disability. Um, and the 2017 Act also creates a category of protected persons and offences against protected persons. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so these are juries. And we heard a bit about um, juries and how this might be amended and updated uh, from Raymond Byrne speaking earlier from the Law Reform Commission. Uh, under the Juries Act of 1976, people who are incapable of serving on a jury are defined as those with mental illness or mental disability for which they're receiving treatment. Now, the 2015 Act doesn't get into that, uh, so it says that um, it doesn't have anything to say about capacity or consent in respect of serving on a jury. But this has been picked up in the Disability Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, which again um, had been making some progress through the, the last oil. Uh, and that is a, a piece of legislation which will bring up to date other, piece, other pieces of legislation to make sure that we're UNCRPD compliant. And that would say that the, um, the deciding factor will be whether somebody has decision making capacity to serve in a jury. That was going to be mental capacity. OK, conscious of time, I'll just go to the next slide to say this, that the Act is not otherwise disapplied in criminal justice. So across all the spheres, policing, courts, the prison system, um, we have to think about ensuring appropriate standards and principles, um, ensuring accessibility of information and those appropriate communications tools, access to the supports under the Act, accommodation of these new support arrangements so that people working in the criminal justice system can expect to encounter these new decision supporters and to ensure equivalence and continuity of care, thinking about um, the prison system there. And I know that the IPRT report from earlier this year certainly called out that. And this is all with a view to ensuring equal and effective access to justice as required by Article 13. So the next slide, and I'll finish on this, is about preparations for commencement. The Decision Support Service has been already liaising with the Garda National Protective Services Bureau um, about where our paths might cross and to work out a memorandum of understanding around that. Um, I, as director, have duties under the Act to promote awareness of it and UNCRPD in a general way uh, and to provide guidance and information to state bodies, which would include those working within criminal justice, to publish codes of practice, which we hope will assist. We also will have our own internal complaints and investigation systems, so we have our Article 13 considerations to apply to ensure that those are accessible. And then there's that broader training requirement, which is called out in Article 13, the second leg of Article 13 of UNCRPD refers to that need to conduct broader training to make sure that all those working across many sectors, including criminal justice, um, are equipped to meet the needs of persons with disabilities in terms of accessibility. And that is it for me, but um, we have a new uh, website which launched just two months ago, and I hope that you'll find more information which will be of assistance there. So thank you very much. Many thanks for that, Anya. That's a, a really useful uh, and, and comprehensive look um, at the, the Capacity Act and its intersection with the, the criminal justice system. So thank you for that. 
Uh, we're going to move uh, to Louise now and ask Louise uh, uh, to present on advocating for people with disabilities in the criminal justice context. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Martina. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do in practice. I think it was Dr. Brona Byrne who mentioned earlier about um, reimagining a justice system um, for people with disabilities rather than one that was designed by lawyers for lawyers. So in the absence of not getting to that nirvana, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do in the criminal justice system currently. Um, and I'm just going to describe some of the cases that we've worked on and maybe draw some pieces out from that that are worth thinking about um, for all the people here today. Um, so could just go on to um, the next slide, please. Um, just to ground us a little bit, just to remind you of the vision statement of our own organisation, which is based upon the UN CRPD, um, which is around a society where people with disabilities can exercise their rights with dignity, autonomy, equality and independence at the core um, and also about recognising the capacity of people with disabilities to make their own decisions equally with others. So that's where we start from um, and I suppose that informs all of our work. Um, if you could skip the next slide please um, and go on to the next one. Thanks. Um, just for those who are not familiar with our organisation, um, we're often shortened to the acronym of, of NAS. Um, and we've been around since 2005 in a variety of forms, but we've been in our current structure since 2014. Um, for the audience today, I suppose what's important to note is that um, it's a free service. We are funded by the Citizens Information Board. So although we do a lot of work in the health um, arena, as well as, as, as this area of work, we're not funded at all by the HSE. Um, and we have around 50 odd staff or so um, across the country. Um, if you move on to the next slide, please. We also um, launched a new patient advocacy service. So that's my, my uh, promo there um, in October last year. Um, so that's just specifically around patients who wish to make a complaint about healthcare they have received. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, and the next one again. Um, so just to talk about what types of referrals come from uh, come into us in this um, justice area, most of them tend to come from other professionals as opposed to people themselves. Um, but just it's a huge breadth of work. It was only when I sat down with my colleagues to look at it, we were quite taken aback by it ourselves. Some of it is around people who are accused of crime and, and quite serious crimes too. Um, others um, partly related to their disability are victims of crimes and have been taken advantage of by others um, and often people who are not charged but they're living in the community without supports and they're kind of bumping up against the criminal justice system. Um, we also receive referrals from the probation service um, and also we are requested to support victims of crimes in relation to interviews. If you could move on please. The sources of the referrals come from the HSC, primarily HSC Disability Services, also from the Probation Service, um, Prison Service, Social Workers and Psychologists, Solicitors and others, um, legal professionals working in this sphere, medical professionals, family members and self-referrals. If you could move on, please. Um, and the type of work that we provide could be communication with the guards, um, it can be attending interviews, although there is no formal structure for us for us to do that. And we do a lot of work supporting people um, working with their representatives, their legal reps around providing information about our role and also about what disability services and other supports the person might be entitled to. Providing people with um, support to communicate with their legal team is a huge part of our work. Um, and also supporting people to attend various evaluations that might be required as part of the criminal justice process. We do also provide some support to people who are attending court during hearings and trials. Um, additionally, also support with probation and other meetings um, and also to apply for protection orders, report crimes, different elements like that. So you can see it's a massive breadth of work. If you could move on, please. So some of the things to think about as I take you through a couple of this, um, the cases, um, this is not an in and out quick piece of work. It's long and sustained. As we've, as we've heard the themes coming out of today, we've talked about the needs to um, work with people uh, in a way that supports them to properly access the system. And that means that that can often slow down a process or change how a process functions. 
Um, so we are involved in that. Um, we have to have a good understanding ourselves of the court system and we also have to continually educate the courts and other professionals about our role. Um, we also have to seek reasonable accommodations for all parties who may require support needs and, and, and I think it would be our view that those reasonable accommodations are often not there. Um, again, it's been touched upon today about the need for criminal justice professionals across the whole arena around um, ONYA's uh, uh, Act, uh, if we call it that, the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act, around capacity generally and communication skills. Um, and also about the needs for supports for people who communicate differently. And we heard some great work about that earlier and some great research that's been done and how that needs to be implemented. Um, there's also a need for our other services, the HSE and disability services, to provide those enduring supports that might help avoid people falling into criminality or becoming victims of crime as well. Um, also safeguarding issues, which I'm sure Patricia will, will touch on after me, is, is a really important part um, that requires significant consideration. If you could move on, please. Now, I have a few slides. I'm not going to go into all of them for time. I'm just going to pick out a couple of cases. And I suppose this is just to bring it down to the nitty gritty of what the work actually looks like. So first of all, I'm going to talk about some people who've been accused of crimes. If you could move on, please. And, and also, of course, we have changed all the names um, and try to avoid any identifying information. So one case that we have here is around Tony, who has aphasia, which affects his speech and comprehension. Um, he's been in remand since early 2019, accused of murder. So it shows you the gravity of the offences, potential offences that are involved. Um, so he's in prison at present and he actually masks his own communication difficulties. Um, so he's quite vulnerable in the prison environment. Um, because of the situation at the minute, the hearings that have taken place have been by video link and that has made it more problematic for Tony. Our role working with him is to help prepare a communication plan around the online meetings. And um, so that will be meetings with his solicitor and also his appearances and what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be in place for him around that. Um, it's likely his trial will be delayed so that will give further, further time um, to prepare around communication supports for any trial which may take place. If you could move on, please. And then another example is Yvette, who's currently serving a sentence for public order offences. Um, she has complex mental health issues and she's an undocumented migrant. Um, we are supporting her to cope in prison, helping her to prepare for release, dealing with her legal team regarding issues surrounding her immigra immigration status. So you can see it's touching off a whole range of issues there that I suppose sometimes it's easy to reduce something down to criminal justice. You know, it's guilty or not guilty, um, remand or not on remand. But it's actually, it, when you're involved in the criminal justice system, it, it affects every aspect of your life. And that can be exacerbated when someone has a disability as well. Um, and again, I suppose what's been happening here is communication has been facilitated by the prison via Zoom. But I think we've already described earlier that, that there are limitations with that form of communication, particularly for those who have complex needs. If you could move on, please. Um, and I suppose these are some of the kind of more uh, complex ones to understand. So Michael has a moderate intellectual disability and he attends a day service. He was accused of a sexual assault early last year by someone else attending the day service and he was kind of effectively barred from his day service pending an investigation. Um, we then contacted the guards on his behalf and we were informed there was in fact no criminal investigation in relation to the, the allegation. Um, we supported him to access the solicitor and ac access to other counselling services. Um, we've supported him to access another disability service in the meantime and get some assistance regarding housing and his mental health. But I suppose regardless of whether the accusation was true or untrue, it points to the complexity of what happened to Michael is that all his support structures kind of collapsed around him when he wasn't able to attend his day service and the importance of having a link person there via advocacy to build that back up again for him. If you could move on, please. Um, and again, this other one uh, is another area that comes up for us. This actually represents about 10 to 15% of our work every year, um, which is around parents with disabilities who have their children um, potentially going into care or already in the care of the state 
uh, either voluntary or, or involuntary basis. This lady has a moderate intellectual disability and three children who are in care. She also had a number of criminal charges um, regarding her alleged neglect of her children. She actually really struggled to understand what was going on. Um, and there has been research elsewhere that has shown the higher likelihood of people with intellectual disability to have their children taken into state care. Um, we had to demonstrate uh, through working very hard, finding appropriate psychiat psychiatrist around her capacity to participate in the trial. And actually that criminal prosecution did not proceed. It was found that she was not, she did not have the capacity to understand um, the proceedings. So I suppose that was a very significant outcome for that woman. And again, um, I think having an advocate there really made a significant difference as to the outcome there. And the next slide, please, thanks. Um, and again, I'm just conscious of time. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about, you know, there's people who are accused of crimes, just touching on maybe where people are alleged victims. If you'd go on to the next one, please. Um, so in this particular one, again, I, I think this points to some complexity and I think we'll, we will, you know, I'm a kind of uh, in the sandwich here between Anya and Patricia, and I suppose where it comes both come into play is the importance of having the commencement of the um the D assisted decision making capacity act, and also the importance of having a framework around safeguarding legislation. So in this particular instance, Billy has an intellectual disability and also has mental health issues as well. He lives with his father and stepmother, um, all, both of whom also have disabilities. He was charged with several offences um, relating to another member of his family um, and consequently uh, he then ended up being threatened um, himself and actually um, we had to follow up on that on his behalf with the guards um, and we also um, had to support him to access temporary accommodation for it was no longer safe for him to remain at home. Um, we also had to identify with his solicitors and um, psychiatrists again back to the point about whether he could reasonably stand trial. Um, in this particular case, he is likely still to go to trial. Again, just what's important to note that this took seven years to go through this entire process. The longevity of this type of work is huge. Um, I know the solicitors and barristers in the audience will be well aware how long these things can take, but it's just important to note the impact on somebody and um, how long it takes to work that work through that. And the next one, please. Um, and again, I just might mention this one briefly again, uh, 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 again, Joe has an intellectual disability and again was accused of crime himself. Um, but he didn't really understand what was going on. But he himself was also the victim of a vigilante style group, um, which seemed to be coming to the fore now, who were uh, accusing him of a variety of things. Um, he was questioned by the guards and his mobile phone was removed. That took place without any supports. We eventually supported him to access a solicitor, but again, he lost his place at his day service um, as a consequence. So again, it's just that piece about the consequences. Um, and perhaps if Joe had had better access at the outset of the process to the appropriate supports, those particular pieces around losing access to his day service might not have happened. If you could just move on again, please. Um, actually, I might just skip over. I'm just conscious of time. So we might just skip over the next couple of slides. Thanks. Um, yeah, and the next one again, please. Thanks. So um, just to say that, you know, wanted to touch upon the complexity of the work, which hopefully I've demonstrated there. And I suppose when we talk about um, the experience of advocacy in the criminal justice system and the overall theme today of the implementation of the UN CRPD in a criminal justice context, it does highlight how important advocacy is. Um, I think a number of, I think it was actually Martina said at the start of today's session, to understand legal processes is highly complex. When you're looking at it as a professional, um, with all the, the supports around you, it's complex. Imagine you're at the heart of it and you might struggle with communication, how difficult that actually is. So I think it behoves us all to really seriously think about how we can design our systems to really support people's disabilities to fully participate. Um, and in the the detail of that is around making sure particularly that legal professionals are properly trained around communication that our systems our court buildings as um justice mary Irvin said earlier are fully accessible and it was great to hear her invitation and um, to contact her about how, how we can all work more closely with the courts and the judges around that so i think i'll finish on that point 
um, and I'll hand back to Martina now. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Louise. Um, uh, your case studies, I have to say, uh, provide a, a real insight and a reality uh, to what we described uh, around the complexity of the justice system. Um, and I think it, uh, really, really valuable, valuable insights there. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Patricia now, um, who's going to um, talk to us um, <laughs> on safeguarding reform, the need for a legal framework. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martina, and uh, thank you to the NGA for inviting me. Sorry, could I have the slide shared if I may? So uh, just while the slides are going up, can I say that, of course, um, uh, the debate on safeguarding is only uh, really a very recent debate. And while we've had child protection legislation and safeguarding legislation for a long number of years, which has been developed over the years, we have no adult safeguarding legislation. So we've situations where we've had those awful cases like Grace and Amy um, and the literally forced to fell through the net um, uh, and fell through the cracks when they reached the age of 18. I'm still not seeing the slides. Could I have um, slides? Please. So what I'm, I, the slides are still not up, what I'm going to talk about really is, uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, refer to a number of the um, articles in the UN Convention, uh, because I think they're a very useful uh, backdrop to the wider discussion on safeguarding. I'm going to look at some data, and we're really bad in this country at collecting data uh, and ensuring that we have the evidence in order to actually make policy and to uh, inform us in relation to enacting legislation. So um, on slide three at the moment, uh, if, if I could have. Slides that would be helpful. Um, so, so legislation in statutory form. Um, so uh, the Safeguard in Ireland, in making its uh, submission to the Law Reform Commission, suggested uh, a definition of safeguarding, which is as follows: Safeguarding is the promotion and protection of the right to live in safety, free from abuse, harm, and neglect of an adult at risk. It is about people and organisations working together to prevent and stop both the risks and experiences of abuse or neglect, while at the same time making sure that the adult's well-being is promoted, including where appropriate, having regard to their views, wishes, feelings, and beliefs in deciding on any action. Uh, so I'm going to uh, look first of all at Article 12, Equal Recognition Before the Law, which, uh, as we all know, it sets out the uh, question of equality, but very importantly at uh, Article 12.4, it provides for appropriate and effective safeguards to prevent abuse in accordance with international human rights law. We've heard uh, today about Article 13 in particular, uh, access to justice. And again, state parties shall ensure effective access to justice for persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. But very importantly, of course, there is the issue of participation, um, uh, regardless of disability, uh, a person at risk or whatever. Article 16, freedom from exploitation, violence, and abuse. State parts should take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social, educational, and other measures to protect persons with disabilities, with disabilities from all forms of exploitation. But very importantly, Article 16.4 provides for an effective uh, uh, independent uh, safeguarding authority um, to effectively monitor. Uh, the uh, issues and, and safeguarding. So that 164 is particularly important. Article 18, then, the liberty of, right to, liberty of movement and nationality, freedom to choose a person's place of residence. This has become a very increasingly safeguarding issue, particularly for older people who are put into a place of care uh, without their consent. So if we look at some of the data that I said, we have very limited data. Safeguarding Ireland, since uh, uh, 2016, I've been doing a number of surveys to try and 
uh, inform ourselves really in relation to some of the issues. Survey in 2000, December 2016 uh, indicated that one in two adults claimed experience of vulnerable adult abuse to either themselves or to uh, somebody close to them. And emotional abuse was the most common type of abuse uh, in relation to uh, one in three having experienced this type of abuse. With the lack of clarity again of who one reports to, that was a huge issue uh, in the safeguarding context. The HSC then, uh, again, very limited data in a very limited area of social care, psychological abuse, a 2018 figure of psychological abuse, 33%, financial abuse, 21%, but if a person goes up to 80s, uh, in their 80s, that can increase to almost 30%. Um, physical abuse, uh, again, uh, increased figures. Again, just to talk about domestic violence, and I know in other jurisdictions, the domestic violence legislation has become actually now to be looked upon as a much wider safeguarding uh, piece of legislation and needs to be developed in that context. So over uh, on the slide, there are figures there for the increase in applications for protection orders, interim barring orders, uh, and safety orders. But uh, last year, the court service did an observance study for a three month period in uh, the second quarter of 2019. And that indicated about 23% of the applications, almost a quarter, whereby parents or older people in relation to either adult children, adult family members, or other people. So domestic violence uh, legislation needs to uh, deal with that. So where you have under the 2019 Act, the HSE safeguarding teams cannot make a direct application to court on behalf of the person. So it's a huge issue in safeguarding. Uh, Article 18 then, the right of residence, place of care. Again, another uh, survey that Safeguarding Ireland did in February of this year in relation to advanced healthcare directors and place of care. And 58% of the population uh, think that a family member or a friend has the authority to make decisions about place of care of another person who may be frail but does have decision-making capacity and this does not require the consent of that person. So a very vulnerable, at-risk person, uh, people think they can uh, carry out abusive practices really and make decisions on their behalf. Um, very recent study we did uh, in relation to uh, COVID-19 and really what were the high issues in terms of abuse during COVID-19 and the highest, uh, uh, the most common forms of abuse both before and after COVID-19 is emotional abuse, psychological abuse, threatening coercive control, undue influence. And again, just to give you the figures, uh, in, in, during COVID in the last six months, emotional abuse was at 25% and psychological abuse, which included undue influence and coercive control was at 70%. But those who had experienced it previously was up over 50% in both categories. So very high um, levels of abuse that were not really uh, uh, understanding or addressing. So I have to move on then to talk about the uh, legislation. Um, and then uh, on the slide, I, uh, slides, I have a number of um, uh, pieces of legislation identified which ONU has addressed in some form. So again, I'm going to move on and uh, just to mention some of them, the Non-Fatal Offences Against the Person Act, Criminal Justice Sector Fraud Act, again, for people who are uh, vulnerable, uh, while we have Criminal Justice Assessment and Fraud Act, uh, really we have a situation where people, uh, where financial abuse occurs within families. We, we just turned a blind eye to really realising that uh, as a criminal offence. And um, we have the Assistance Decision Making Capacity Act, uh, the data sharing and governance legislation, and again we use uh, the data sharing and the GDP law as an excuse or a shield not to share information about very vulnerable people. So just to give examples there where we have worked, uh, I think Martina said, or somebody said, we work across all spectrums uh, in relation to working together uh, for people with disabilities and indeed uh, for people who are at risk. So uh, all our legislation though is predicated on working in limited uh, silo uh, situations. So we look, they look at the criminal justice withholding of information uh, uh, on offences against children and vulnerable persons act, uh, we see, and that is where uh, an offence is being committed by a person who knows or believes uh, that one or, or more offences have been committed. 
uh, against a child or vulnerable person, uh, but they haven't passed it on. Uh, but actually that is limited to a person with a disability and also the offences are very serious offences. But we have a culture of withholding information for many other offences uh, and abuses, and there's no obligation to report. I mentioned the financial abuse, and we don't even, uh, it's not included obviously in this 2012 Act. So that's just one example. Another example, again, is the sexual offences, and only mentioned this one, uh, 2017 Act. Again, it's uh, a definition of a person who has, uh, whose decision making capacity has, is at issue. And again, it's predicated on a diagnostic test, but it doesn't include a, a person who is at risk, a very vulnerable person. Um, we have the Assistance Decision Making Capacity Act. Uh, and again, we badly need its commencement because it has mechanisms there in it. But if we had, had that uh, fully commenced during the COVID-19, for example, uh, we would have had mechanisms in place uh, to support people like assisted decision maker where the person themselves was still making decisions um, but actually uh, can still make decisions but we hadn't got it in place. Therefore we put in other um, mechanisms to deal during COVID-19 which caused huge safeguarding issues like appointing temporary aid and advisors to collect pension in the Department of Social Protection or the, the, the banks then uh, arranging, uh, uh, making arrangements for people who had capacity but maybe at risk who were continuing. And a very recent survey we did indicated uh, that in fact 11% um, of uh, that group actually handed over control of their finances uh, to another person and only uh, two thirds have been taken back control. So we have issues there that we really need uh, to um, uh, deal with. Uh, the Decision Making Act, uh, Oanya mentioned, uh, the offence of ill-treatment and willful neglect, uh, but that is limited to decision supporters. It doesn't embrace all people who ill-treat or willfully neglect a person whose capacity, a relevant person whose capacity is an issue, or indeed uh, a person who is a very uh, vulnerable person. Uh, so again, very limited. Um, the uh, 2015 Act, uh, Access to Justice, I would highlight legal advice and legal representation is provided for in relation to an application under part five of the act, uh, but there's no provision in relation to a court application under, under any other part of that act. And there's no positive statement for access to legal advice or legal representation. Um, there's no provision in any legislation for a vulnerable person or an at risk, at -risk adult uh, to have uh, access to legal advice or legal representation, except under the Mental Health Act. Um, so um, again, I'm very conscious of the time the domestic violence coercive control very limited in terms that that offence of coercive control is limited to uh, a relevant person for the purposes of that act is a person who is a spouse, a civil partner, or who is not a spouse, a civil partner, uh, but is um, actually in an intimate relationship or has been. So again, very, very limited. Yet our figures in terms, as I pointed out, of coercive control on due influence is huge in the safeguarding context. And that um, offence on the 2018 Act uh, doesn't uh, cover it. So if we could look then at the proposed legislation, um, first of all, um, uh, Safeguarding in Ireland assisted Senator Colette Kelleher to introduce adult safeguarding legislation uh, in two, uh, adult safeguarding bill in 2017. In that was included a definition of an adult at risk. We had the provision for the establishment of a national safeguarding authority. Uh, provision for a right of entry uh, and inspection by what we call authorised uh, persons to protect the person or to obtain information about a person uh, and a number of other points, right to access to an independent advocate, which is clearly uh, extremely important. That bill lapsed, of course, on the whole of the government, um, but it is imperative that we see some of those provisions in um, uh, adult safeguarding legislation to be introduced. Uh, we mentioned today the Law Reform Commission's um, uh, looking at uh, the regulatory framework for adult uh, safeguarding. I would say Article 16 of the UN Convention very clearly looks to an independent authority. So I heard what Ray Byrne said earlier in terms of looking at the various, like PICOR, the HPC, or the Mental Health Commission, uh, working in collaboration uh, to monitor, but I think actually our, our 
obligation under the convention is that we have an independent monitoring authority it's really important in the legislative program there is provision for uh, health adult safeguarding bill but again uh, very limited uh, to the health context and really safeguarding ireland uh, are adamant since its uh, inception in 2016 that we have uh, all embracing adult safeguarding legislation and we don't find ourselves picking in and out and being like coercive control uh, 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 um, legislation not being wide enough to protect and keep safely very vulnerable people. Uh, the Oireachtas Committee, the um, uh, COVID-19 Committee, uh, did actually recommend that there should be no unnecessary delay in implementing adult safeguarding legislation. So to conclude, can I say, borrowing from the UNCRPD, the state has clear obligations to take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social, educational, and other measures to protect vulnerable or at-risk adults from all forms of exploitation, violence, and abuse. There are large gaps in legislation, practice, systems, and organizations that are very costly on individual lives and do not respect the rights or dignity of the person. These gaps are also costly for the state as organizations and, to, and for organizations and institutions, institutions where their scarce resources are being allocated to deal with the outcome of the lack of proper and appropriate measures uh, being in place and keep people safe. And we know the various tribunals and the cost of those in terms of race and others. And yet we still do not have adult safeguarding legislation, which will, if we had systems in place, at least some of that money could be used to protect very vulnerable people. So thank you. Sorry about the slides. Um, uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Patricia. Um, and I suppose, look, you identified the challenges emerging uh, around and COVID, but I suppose it's also important to acknowledge that the, 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 the challenges existed before COVID, but I think they, they, they've been highlighted and a spotlight thrown on them by, by COVID and the points you make there are, are well made, uh, Patricia. I, thanks to all of, of our speakers. We're going to take some questions. We have um, some in our, our web, web chat here uh, and what I'm going to do uh, if you don't mind I'm, I might start with uh, Anya uh, there's a question from Susan um, how can legal professionals members of Angarda Siakana officials in the prison service the judiciary all prepare for the commencement of the 2015 act Okay, thanks very much. And yes, absolutely, um, preparation is is key. Um, the decision making, the decision support service is available as a resource. Um, I've referred to our website, um, and we welcome feedback on it. It provides some information, providing an overview of the act and some tips on how to prepare for it. The codes of practice, I think, will be of assistance, and they will be put out for public consultation. I hope during next year, uh, when we have a finalised act, there's amending legislation making its way through. Um, so there will be a code which provides overall guidance on supporting decision making um, and assessing capacity and I hope that that will help. Um, and the decision support service, as I've mentioned, uh, does have a statutory, statutory duty to promote organisational change um, and to undo any blockers that might uh, prevent somebody exercising their decision making capacity. So we have a role in that. Um, we aren't the, the regulator, obviously, of, of the um, entities that you've mentioned. So there is a duty on employers and regulators to ensure that training is happening. Uh, we will help with that if called upon to do so. But I would urge that people working within those sectors do um, equip themselves with knowledge uh, around the Act. And uh, a lot of work is being done to, to prepare. It cuts across many sectors. Um, so I, I would urge that people avail of the resources which are there. Thanks a million, Anya. Thank you for that. Uh, Patricia, uh, perhaps you, you could help on this, and, and there's a, it's, a, it's a, a tricky question, I think. Um, so Jackie has asked, a question of concern to me is around the Dying with Dignity Bill. It talks about assisted suicide, but doesn't seem to clearly set out issues around capacity. And 
Jackie wonders, could the proposed definitions of a terminal illness be abused in relation to disabled people, especially in safeguarding context? Um, yeah, I th sorry. yeah. It, it, it is a difficult question to answer, and I think uh, the bill is quite limited in safeguards. So I think that we need that debate in the Rockfest uh, before the committee, and uh, certainly a lot of submissions need to be made on that point, particularly on the safeguarding issues. So I think we need to be very clear. And uh, that was one of the advantages, I think, of our 2015 Act. There was a lot of debate around safeguarding at that time, and I think you know, we've got quite a number of safeguards into that legislation. So into this assisted dying, um, the dying with dignity bill, we certainly need wide debate, really concentration on what safeguards should be in there and are necessary and practical and can work. And respect the person's wishes and to whatever. Thanks, Patricia. Um, there's a question here from Aoife as well. It, it just... I'm not sure, quite sure if it's it's a question or a statement, Aoife, but hopefully I do it justice for you. And I'm not quite sure who might be able to help. It could be Louise or Anya on this. Just to clarify, under the Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act, it is assumed in all cases that the person doesn't have the capacity to give consent, question mark. Sorry, yeah, tricky. Uh, will, will I, Louise, do you want me to venture there? Um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, consent to sexual relations is one of those areas which the 2015 Act specifically says um, it doesn't deal with, so that the definition of what capacity means in the 15 Act um, doesn't apply to the Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act of 2017, so that's where you look for your definition around capacity um, and also on understandably, uh, the decision supporters that can step in to make decisions and to supply consent under the 15 Act don't have a role um, when it comes to the area of sexual relations. Uh, Section 21 of the uh, Sexual Offences Act of 17 deals with that. Um, and what it has to say is, I did see that question come in, so I made sure to check. Um, so it says that a person lacks capacity to consent to a sexual act if by reason of a mental or intellectual disability or mental illness. So it puts in that uh, diagnostic presentation, if you like, if they're incapable of understanding the nature, reasonably foreseeable consequences of the sexual act or evaluating the relevant information and communicating consent by whatever means, which could include sign language. So that's how capacity is specifically defined under the Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act of 2017. But there's nothing to say that there isn't a, a presumption of capacity, uh, which is already the common law standard, and then which is called out in the 2015 Act. I hope that helps. I might just come in there briefly, Martina. Um, prior, prior to the 2017 Act, um, in the previous legislation, there was a kind of general misunderstanding um, that sexual activity between people with disabilities or with one person with a disability, particularly intellectual disability, was some form of criminal activity that that was a quite a well-held view and the 2017 act did go some way to address that and um, it isn't that clear and i can see why you're asking the question but i think to Anya's point the presumption of capacity is there and that um also applies to consent to sexual um activity so i think that's the starting point for all of us um, and then you can go into the particular acts for the detail great thanks really louise thank you um, Anya, I don't know if you want to take this one or, or, or is there a decided date in 2022 for the commencement of the Act? Um, to... and, well, uh, we were happy um, to see that we got support in the budget allocation last week um, and uh, as Martina, you will know from your very recent past, we had mapped out a plan at the request of the Department of Justice to say uh, how we'd be able to roll out the decision support service um, within a 24 month timeline. I know everyone, including ourselves, would like that to be faster and that was considered realistic. So from the point of view of the decision support service, as far as we're concerned, we're on track for go live in the middle of 2022. Um, the decision support service isn't the only bit of the 2015 Act. I think you can't have a 2015 Act that's up and running without the decision support service. But as I hope is clear and certainly clear from today, there are a host of other entities that need to be getting themselves ready 
as well. So I can't speak to the preparations of others. Uh, we're closely um, in communication with, for example, the court service and the Department of Health and so on. But there are other um, activities, other uh, preparatory work to be done across other sectors. But the Decision Support Service is on track for 2022. Martina, I suppose just... Sorry, sorry Patricia, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I come in there, uh, just as, as we know, the expert panel on COVID-19, uh, as part of their recommendation, recommended that the sections on capacity the, uh, and the assessment of capacity and advanced healthcare directives be uh, commenced within six months of their report, which was at the end of July 2020. And an implementation group has now been set up, as we all know, to implement and to prioritise the recommendations uh, of the COVID-19 expert panel. So uh, I would expect, and just to say that, of course, as we know, um, the functional test capacity has been part of our common law for a number of years. It's in the HSE consent policy and also in the medical council guidelines. So we really need, uh, particularly the sections on capacity and how it should be assessed, and th then the principles as well, uh, to be commenced straight away. And really, uh, there's nothing, I, I know that it's support service has work to do and organizations uh, could be set up and, and whatever but for capacity assessment that's not uh, required uh, so there's nothing to stop that part of the act being commenced and I hope uh, and certainly the same party in Ireland will be pushing for that commencement uh, as early as possible. Thanks Patricia that's useful. That, great thank you. At this stage, um, I don't think there are any more um, questions um, for our panelists. Um, so it just remains, uh, I think, uh, for this breakout session for me to thank everybody for attending this webinar. And in particular, to thank our contributors, Anya, Louise and Patricia for what were really very informative and insightful um, sessions. I hope everybody else found the same. Um, all of today's sessions will be available to watch uh, again after the conference uh, on the NDA website. Um, but thank you to the National Disability Authority and thanks to everybody for today's inputs. Thank you.